It's a great pleasure to be asked to present this bicentennial inaugural lecture. I thank the Vice-Chancellor, Aegis and the Lyle Centre for providing me with this opportunity late in my career. What you see on this slide represents my 50 years as a geoscientist since starting an environmental sciences degree at Lancaster University, a PhD at the University of Manchester. And since then I've worked in five countries, England, USA, Canada, France and Scotland, in two languages, English and French, as a geologist, I've worked in some wonderful places from the tops of mountains and volcanoes to the ocean floor. I've been at the highest level for a geoscientist in the academic, government and research fields and was recognised for my contributions to geosciences through a CBE in 2016. My role in the Lyle Centre will allow me to give back some of my experience and to help build the centre into the multidisciplinary international centre that is well on the way to becoming. I've called this talk Big, Chi Big Geosciences for the Future. Much of what I'll be talking about is the solid earth sciences part of the discipline and not the ocean or climate sciences. In, in short, geology. I use this title for two reasons. Firstly, that I played a major role myself in pushing Big Earth Sciences projects and I believe that we need to go further in our ambitions in order to be competitive. And secondly, that geologists can be too inward looking and focus on their field areas, albeit beautiful, such as the one you see here in Iceland, or even focus on the outcrop or the fossil type. And although very important and highly skilled, this needs to be coupled to big ambitious projects. So why does geoscience matter? Understanding the dynamic earth, the motors, what's driving the planet, and how, those, how they interact with the climate, and how they interact with mountain formation. Creating a, self and a safe and healthy planet, in particular understanding earthquakes, understanding erosions and understanding landslides and such. Driving sustainable growth through our resources, through using our resources sustainably. And also reducing global inequities, a good example being water and water shortage in Africa. So there are some new drivers for geosciences. The diversification of energy supplies and decarbonisation, reducing global emissions, clearly related, understanding geological risk rather than geological hazard. In the past, we've tended to focus on the hazard and not how it affects populations. Global population change, open and big data, and the need for it and the use of it, and the risks with, with that data, tougher environmental regulations, and in particular, greater public scrutiny of our science. So what, to start with, I'm going to summarize some big satellite-based projects. Not that I've actually been involved in them personally, or I've used data from these projects, but more that I've been involved in promoting these projects in my role in Europe over the past decades. This first one is on gravity. So it's looking at the shape of the earth, the distribution of the mass of the earth, and, you know, grace, first showed us that this distribution in the shape of the Earth, where here in the Indian Ocean you see a variation of about 400 metres between southern India and the southern Indian Ocean. More recently, and the future, involves using satellites which will allow us to understand how the water, how water and how magma and how mass is distributed in the shallow crust. For example, the slide here showing you the weight of water uh, in the United States at plus or minus 300 millimeters. That's going to be pushed through a project called GRACE follow-on and uh, we're, is currently active actually. Then the magnetic field. This is an interesting one because actually the Lyle Center including the British Geological Surveys is involved in this work and has actually led on some of the programming and pulling this together and it involves a swarm of satellites which look at the magnetic field on the planet. You can see here how it varies it varies day to day, minute to minute, second to second, which is important in understanding and informing uh, weather forecasts, informing uh, how we land planes, and actually informing drilling technology, and in particular, in understanding the space weather and how that impacts on the grid and such like. The next example is heat. This, this slide here is actually a compilation of about 13,000 heat flow measurements across the planet integrated across the planet and what it shows you actually is where the mantle gets closest to the surface and interestingly as we probably know the, the earth is cooling has been cooling exponentially 
So most of the heat was lost from the Earth in the first two million years, but we can still use this heat for geothermal energy, and I'll come back to that later. And I think probably one of the most important uh, space contributions to Earth sciences is the Sentinel suite of satellites, which are looking at the radar interferometry, looking at how the, the Earth shape changes on a millimetric scale. So this slide here actually shows the Bay of Naples, and it shows Vesuvius and Campo Flegri. And I'll come back to those later on. But anyway, we can look at the minute variations in uplift and down drop in these areas, or shifting of plates, or shifting on faults. Really important for understanding how earthquakes work and how volcanoes work. And these missions will be used and have been used in the past for looking at how icebergs move, how ice sheets move, how glaciers move, and how the Earth's surface is deforming in general. Now, this is a more pragmatic sort of project that I think most uh, Earth scientists are aware of. It's called the International Ocean Discovery Program now, but it started almost 50 years ago as the deep sea drilling project. And here you can see dotted across the, the planet, mainly in the deep ocean, and I'll come back to that later, the sa sampling that the Earth, of the Earth by IODP or ODP or DSDP. My particular role in this is I, I was co-chief scientist on, on two legs, both of them around the West Pacific and Australia, and essentially it was looking at what we call the subduction factory, trying to understand what goes in to the Earth through subduction in these in the ring of fire and how that changes and how that influences how the planet evolved through time or how the planet is evolving. But to an extent, IEDP, although a superb pro project and will continue going, and some of our scientists, I think Tom Wagner from Lyle is about to, to go on a, an ODP leg in the next few months, I would argue that we need to, to really grasp some big projects and some high risk and high reward projects. So in 2004, 2003, we, four, we created what we called ECORD. So we, the Europeans got together and said, we need to have our own, our own ocean drilling projects, but we'll integrate them with the Americans and with the Japanese. And so we created ECORD, which actually focused on using what we call mission-specific platforms, which would go into, the, into ice-covered regions and shallow seas, such as reefs, where the other platforms couldn't. This, this project here, ASEX, is actually the first project ever to drill in an ice-covered region like this for science. And we actually had three vessels up there, and, and we had to keep the ice open. And we managed to drill the first section through the sediments on the Lomonosov Ridge, about 200 meters from the North Pole. High risk, high reward. The reward was actually almost 30 papers in Science and Nature. And now we need to actually move to the next stage. And, and since 2004, we have not been able to manage to raise the funding to actually do ASEX2. But we will do it, I'm sure. Coming back to me a bit and going back to the 1990s, this is, I was one of the pioneers of a large scale, full scale seismic crustal imaging of the Earth actually across Canada. So we were, the, the aim here, we had a lot of funding from Canada. We integrated geophysics and geochemistry and structural geology, and we made a section of the Earth across the Canadian continent. And we looked, we saw for the first time in relatively high resolution, the full crust and actually below the crust, the roots of the cratons. And it was, a, it was pioneering work. And I, I show you a piece of, of science that I did here, actually probably one of my more interesting ones where the slide is intentionally inverted. And what you see here is what we consider to be a three billion year old subduction system. And the argument was, did subduction, did plates move around and subduct in the early earth? Or was the tectonics different in that actually it was much hotter and things were blobbing up and down on the crust as opposed to being moving horizontally in, an, in a subduction system? We think we proved, actually, as you can see here, there's a subduction system going underneath a uh, crustal system in uh, the Canadian Superior Province. We think we proved that actually subduction existed in the Archae, and I think a lot of people actually believe that now. I call it solving the undisprovable because actually no one can ever prove in the end whether we're right or wrong. So 
actually the next stage of that has been to actually to we pioneered this sort of imaging of the crust and here you can see some work going down about 20 kilometers and it's in underneath what's called the Gawler Craton in Australia. The blue and pink images are electrical images and the one with the the more dotted lines are seismic images um, of a couple of hundred kilometers of the Australian crust and, and actually what this, this work has been targeted on is looking to see if we can see deep in the earth or deep in the crust and if that helps us locate large mineral systems. This work was done under one of the biggest mineral systems on the planet called Olympic Dam and as you can see actually these zones named here C2, C2, R2 and C3 on that diagram are zones of fluid coming through the crust which should actually help de-risk exploration in the future for large ore deposits. I would argue that this work is quite pioneering, it was built on Lithopro, and actually it should be done in Africa. So how do we get the funding to actually do this sort of work in Africa, where there are large ore deposits as well as yet probably, certainly in, in, uh, with the exception of South Africa, to be found. So we can do a lot more due to the technical revolution that we're going through. And you can see here real-time imaging, putting sensors down holes, big computing and visualization. Combining all that together allows us to start to solve some problems that we couldn't solve before. We, and a lot of this can be applied to uh, decarbonizing the planet and moving towards net zero. So through uh, Harriet Watt, a lot of our initiatives are around this. Here are some examples here of why we need geological solutions to help us decarbonize. One of them is radioactive waste, uh, in this case radioactive waste storage. Uh, but the, there is a large question as to whether nuclear should be underpinning some of our base load going forward. Shale gas, you're aware of that debate, but again, closer monitoring, closer understanding of the subsurface allows us to do it more carefully and with less environmental impact. Geothermal, again, geothermal energy is presumed to be clean, but in actual fact, there are some risks behind it, and we'll come back to that in the end. Carbon capture and storage, hydrogen storage, and also compressed air storage. So there's a lot going on there, carbon capture storage, underpinning probably uh, the next phase of decarbonization. Hydrogen storage coming on the agenda now the ability to produce hydrogen by electrolysis or, or from methane, but then we need to store it and we need to use that to fill in between uh, solar and other forms of renewable energy. Again, using sensor systems here, moving to big geophysics. So I was involved in a project, project called the Global Earthquake Model. That project was supported by, or is still supported by a large number of reinsurance companies, Zurich Re, for example, Munich Re, and basically, it's a, it's a usable data system that people can use for planning. And it's affecting a shift from the identification of the hazard, actually to modeling a prediction, which we do now in, in the earthquakes, and the communication of geological risk, where has, hazard affects people directly. This particular slide here is of South America, and the yellows and the greens and the blues are... are the instrumental earthquakes, they're the earthquakes that we measured by instruments. And the, the magenta colored squares, interestingly, are actually the historical record of earthquakes going back several hundred years. And what's interesting there is that you can see that the magenta uh, trend is actually underlying historical regions which have not yet been as active as we might expect. And so, for example, here I, I'm point, I point to Bogota and Quito, which are on that line in northern South America, which are at extreme risk from large earthquakes. And this sort of work helps us understand that. And now we're moving more and more towards what I would call an operational forecasting. And this work comes from Margarita Sigu in BGS. And it's a perfect example of, of earthquake science serving disaster risk reductions in really challenging settings. So we're coming a long way towards Certainly understanding and be able to model an earthquake post a major eruption and be able to save lives. The, the holy grail is to predict an earthquake and we haven't quite got there yet, but we, we know what sort of things might be happening in the future. 
So, starting to sum up, before I actually do give you a little cliche on one of my pet projects, is, you know, I think our scientists should be doing extreme science, what I call extreme deer science. And, and perhaps our science is too parochial. For example, three examples here. Can we drill into a magma body and control the fluid magma system and directly measure systems that, or conditions that threaten a large city? Here, we're back in the Naples, the Bay of Naples area, which is, as you know, a, a volcanic area and actually has several million people. Can we start to control the system and can we predict an eruption such that we can uh, evacuate properly or we can actually stop the eruption? I'll come back to that in a second. Can we undertake a fully researched hydrofrack? We've, you know, we, we know we're using hydrofracking for shale gas. We also use hydrofracking for geothermal activity. No one's really done what we would call a fully researched hydrofrack. So, and now actually through the UK GS project that NERC has funded and BGS is leading the operational side of, we're starting to get to that point. Can we significantly modify the growth of a coral reef? Or can we engineer wetlands and soils to enhance CO2 removal? Rather than just wait for it, can we actually do things which allow us to speed up that reaction? Can we inject carbon dioxide into rocks and re-react and save and store the carbon dioxide? The second slide on this is we should, in my opinion, start thinking seriously about exploring and inhabiting the moon and Mars, in inverted commas, because we will. In fact, technology will take us there. I think the private sector will take us there soon. So we need to be able to geoengineer when we're there. We need to be able to build housing. We need to understand or housing. We need to be able to build habitation. We need to be able to understand the soils. We need to be able to understand how much water is in the rocks and how to use it. So I think that'll be a, bring a rejuvenation of the study of the petrology of rocks which has gone a little bit stagnant recently. Can we understand and model the physical and chemical nature of the Earth? Innovate with remote sensing and quantum sensors. I've shown some examples, but we will go further. We can do it almost real time, almost everywhere. In a minute, I'm gonna show you us doing this in a thousand degree environments. Can we create a step change in environmental prediction and develop data systems which will enable humanity to achieve equilibrium with the Earth by 2050. You can ask me at the end what I mean by achieving equilibrium. I think you can understand that. We've had a couple of projects out there that have been promoted through the European system. One of them I pushed called the Ultimate Earth Project. They're deemed to be sometimes too large, sometimes too ambitious, or sometimes you get jealous factions which tend to fight for their own corner. So you, know, you never get this big holistic approach. Again, that's a problem with our science. People who tend to fight their own corner rather than thinking for the big picture. Coming towards the end, sort of one of my pet projects and one of the reasons I'm in the Lyra Centre at the moment is I want to push the idea of really understanding magma near the surface of the Earth. So this slide here is a spectacular slide. This is actually a geothermal power station in Iceland, you can see Reykjavik in the background. And underneath that, there's a magma system. Underneath that, there's magma, in this case, probably of around three or four kilometers. However, in the north of Iceland, in, a, in, the, in the Krafla Caldera, which you see here, up in the northern Iceland, just before the, the, the ridge system exits back in, into the Atlantic Ocean, into the Koblenski Ridge, there's a hydrothermal area that, again, is uh, really hot. And in, about, in 2012, the uh, Icelandic energy company, Landsjökull, along with the International Drilling project, project, drilled into that area below that magma system. And they were aiming to, to hit something at four kilometers. In actual fact, they hit a magma body at 2.2 kilometers, so they, they went from about 250 degrees to about 900 degrees into what's a magma called a rhyolite in about 200 meters, from 200, from 2 kilometers to 2.2 kilometers. So we know there's a, 
a magma system there. We know there's a magma body sitting there. We actually know that it's molten, it's not crystallizing. That's a good question. Why isn't it crystallizing? It should be cooling. And we now intend to um, create a project which is called the Kraftler Magma test, test Bed, where we intend to actually penetrate that zone between the molten magma and the crystallized rock and the fluids that, that are associated with that. And I'm in the process of trying to get this project going. I think we now have phase zero funded, which means we'll do the planning and, and the safety case and model some of the system. Probably by about 2023, we should be in a position to drill into the magma body. And we think we can drill into the magma body and measure its temperature. Uh, and just to prove that we can do that sort of thing. And that should be 2023. This slide here shows actually what happened in, uh, in about 2012 when they actually penetrated the carapace of the magma chamber and they actually managed to, 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 to flow test and, and run the well for a period. They weren't expecting the sort of extreme temperatures that they got. We know they're there, so we can deal with them now. But here you see the, uh, the, the drill hole actually blowing pure silicon uh, steam into the atmosphere in this case. This is super critical. It's around 450 degrees. So the question is, if you can get power from this sort of really high temperature systems, you can get an order of magnitude increase in power. So this little slide here summarizes what you want to do. The Kraftler International Magma Test Bed is at 900 degrees, it's at 2.2 kilometers depth. We will we'll create facilities and lodging there. We'll set up uh, an environmental center on top of this. We'll bring tourists in as well, we hope. We'll drill a series of boreholes looking at temperature, pressure, compositional changes as a function of time. And what's, what are the four big things? We want to extract 10 times the power than existing geothermal wells to, to, to really see push the bounds of geothermal energy near magma. We want to directly measure conditions in magma that might threaten a large city. So I talked about Naples right, in the past. We want to learn how to freeze or geoengineer a magma body. Can we stop an eruption under Naples? Can we stop a Vesuvian type eruption, which isn't silly because the actual volume of magma in, in the system is quite small. Or it, uh, certainly can we measure it and see it better? Can we start to, to predict things better? And then can we experiment in the hottest and easy, easily accessible place on the planet? So can we send things down this drill hole which are, uh, to understand how they behave? And the reason for that might be to prepare missions such as the missions to, to Venus where you have similar conditions. Really ambitious, really high risk, really exciting, and I'm pushing this at the moment. But behind all that, behind all of this science at the subsurface, we're seen by, often seen by the public as, as part of the problem. So here's some ex examples for carbon capture, nuclear, fracking and such like. So, the real challenge, one of the big challenges for geoscientists at the moment is to communicate this and we are working more and more closely with social scientists and economic scientists trying to, to convince the public. But not under my backyard is a major problem. And, but at the end we have to, as I said, come to equilibrium with the earth. We have to accept that in some areas we may have to store things underground, we may have to extract water from underground. We may, have to, we may have to store water underground as well, and we probably will need to get heat from underground in the future. So finally, what are the challenges for geosciences? There's a summary here of question marks more than necessarily proposals. Again, feeding into the global, the global goals of, for sustainable development. So I think we do need to fix the disconnect between discovery science, applied science, and translation of science. I think that's a big problem in our sciences. Some people tend to get their paper in nature and then move on to the next paper in nature without thinking about what the importance of what they're doing is. That's changing, but it's something we need to deal with. It needs to become a part of the norm, as it is in medical sciences, where you have your paper in nature, then you try and develop a cure for something. So we need to cure the earth. We need to move from solutions to problems. Sorry, from problems to solutions. So are we too focused on the Earth's history rather than its future? Are, you, are we too focused looking back at, the, at how the Earth used to be rather than looking forward? Now, you can argue that yeah, looking back helps us understand looking forward, but to an extent is the balance between looking back and looking forward as opposed to or looking now at the Earth and measuring things now. Is that right? Should we be solving environmental problems rather than simply identifying them? 
So we really move to the to the problem solving side of things, which requires us to work with with engineering scientists, but also with social scientists and also with economics and such like. So we need to move to that space. We need to move close, we need NERC to work more closely with EPSRC, for example. Is there an inherent arrogance against studying applied problems? I leave the question. We should grasp some big earth science projects. I've mentioned a few. I think we, you know, much of what we've done in the past has helped us really gain visibility, but we need some big flagship projects which allow us to be able to stand up there alongside the astronomers and alongside the engineers and say, look at, look at who we are. We need to develop better links with socioeconomic research. I've said why, and that's obvious. And we should be concerned about decreasing enrollment and the skill shortages, shortages in emerging geo industries. And finally, you know, one, another thing I'm doing while I'm here in, in, uh, in Harriet Watt is developing this Hutton series of the deeper thinking, trying to bring together the, the scientists, the finance and business, and the concerned citizen to come up with the the, or what we think are, 10 key challenges and priorities to mitigate the climate crisis. Thank you very much.